welcome. Uh, tonight we're dealing with our third uh, thinker, Jean Dominique Croissant, born February 17, 1934, in Nenagh County, Tipperary, Ireland. People were saying, what's that a map of? That's Ireland. <laughs> and the, the dark green part is where he was from. What's the pink? Northern, Northern Ireland. Ireland. Good, geography lesson, okay. Uh, as a child, he became uh, sort of steeped in rural Irish life, which he experienced through uh, frequent visits to the home of his paternal grandparents. Um, upon graduation in 1950 from a boarding high school, he joined the Servite Order. It's a Catholic religious order. And then he moved to the United States. And he was trained at Stonebridge Seminary, Lake Bluff, Illinois and ordained a Catholic priest in 1957. He returned to Ireland where he earned his Doctor of Divinity degree from St. Patrick's College, Maymouth, which is the Irish National uh, Seminary. He then completed two more years of study in biblical languages at the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome. He then went to uh, East Jerusalem, which was at the time under the control of the Jordanian government. He studied at the Ecole Biblique. Uh, uh, just escaped. Remember what was going on in 1967? There was a war, the Six Day War, we now call it. And he was just able to get out uh, before things went. Uh, he then went to uh, St. Mary of the Lake Seminary in uh, Mundelein, Illinois, and a year at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. He then resigned as a priest. He decided there were other things he wanted to include in his life, if you get my drift. Priests. <laughs> okay, in any case, um, in the fall of 69, he joined the faculty of DePaul University, a well-known Catholic university, uh, and he taught there for the next 26 years in comparative religion. So that's, he ended up being a, a, a teacher, uh, a professor teaching comparative religion. Uh, with a man by the name of Robert W. Funk, he served as co-chair of the Jesus Seminar, which was a group of academics studying the historical Jesus. And I'll have much more to say about that uh, in a few moments. Uh, he also served as president of the Chicago Society of Biblical Research and president of the Society of Biblical Literature. He's very well read, uh, knows a lot of languages, has studied the texts. Uh, he married uh, Margaret, De, I believe her name was Dejene, who was a professor at Loyola University in the summer of 69. Unfortunately, in 83, she died of a heart attack. Uh, he later married uh, Sarah Sexton, a social worker with two grown children. Uh, he's still alive, he's now 88, he's retired, but he continues to write and lecture. So that's a little bit of his background. Croissant is not technically a theologian. He didn't write, what, what's the term? A systematic theology. Uh, he's rather what we might call a historian of religion, but I've included him because his thought has had a great impact on lots of thinkers, both Protestant and Catholic. Um, so before looking at some of the works, let's take a look at two of the methodologies that he used. One is called the historical critical method, and the other uh, is, will be the Jesus Seminar, which you'll get to in a moment. So, what's the historical critical method? Well, it traces its history back to what is known as higher biblical criticism, which is a branch of literary analysis that investigates the origins of a text. As applied in biblical studies, it investigates the books of the Bible and compares them to other texts written at the same time 
before or recently. So it's, it's putting it in context with an entire literary field. So it's not seen as something that stands outside of that. Uh, it's, a, it's been fairly controversial, but it's been very important in terms of uh, uh, modern uh, theological studies, and maybe Reverend Elbert might say a few words later about what his experience in, in the seminary. So what it does is it treats scripture not as a supernatural reality that falls out of the sky, but rather as human created texts that while containing degrees of transcendent wisdom, have also been influenced, and this is what is important, by the historical and cultural forces or context in which they were created. So it's going to look at the biblical text in the larger socio-cultural historical. So in so doing, it treats scripture, like I said, not as supernatural reality, but as literary. Now that doesn't mean that the texts don't have transcendent wisdom or that they don't speak spiritual truths. But they're seen as being written by human beings with all the limitations that that always has. Um, and I think this is important to repeat. It's also been influenced by the historical and cultural forces. Okay? So you have to understand, if you were to understand any text religious or otherwise, written today, you'd want to know something about American history and culture now. Okay? It's in, everything's in context to some degree. Thus, logical, historical, and linguistic analysis are used as tools of interpretation. So what would be a logic, if you're using logic, if you find things that are in contradiction within a text, you want to point that out. That's, that goes against logic, right? For example, uh, Luke says Jesus was born in a manger. Matthew says he was born in a house. Whether those details are important, and to some people they are, that's a contradiction. And you want to point that out. What would be a historical tool? Well, if you know the certain date of something, and then you find in the text the contradiction to that, you've got an issue you want to explore. Uh, a good example, um, it's often been said in scripture that in 4 BC there was a, uh, the Romans had um, a census. Well, we, there's no historical record in Rome of a census in that time. Okay. Now, are these things important? Maybe so, maybe not. But the, these little details, if we're looking at what actually, trying to see what actually happened, then there's going to be a contradiction there. Uh, what would be a linguistic tool? If you find a term or a series of terms used in a text that don't seem to fit the time, what if I gave you a text and I said, this is from the 1950s, and it, in, you're reading along and it says, Awesome, dude. <laughs> that phrase wasn't used in the night, as far as I know. <laughs> so those are the sort of tools that they're looking at, and they're looking at scripture. Uh, so this was initially applied uh, in the early 18th and 19th century to the Hebrew Bible, specifically as regards the origin and authorship of the Torah. Because tradition, what did tradition say? Who wrote the Torah? Moses. That was the tradition. Uh, and this man, Julius Wellenhausen, started, uh, argued that the Torah had its origins as what is known in the field as a redaction, which all it means is editing, of four originally independent texts dating from several centuries after the time of Moses. So they looked at, I, we, I'm not going to go into all the, how they got, came to this conclusion, but using the tools that I, that I was suggesting, they figured out that there are things in that text that could have only come after the time of Moses. 
If I said FDR took a 747, <laughs> you know, something's wrong there, okay? So this was his conclusion. And he's not trying to undermine the message, but he is trying to get to the historical facts. So in terms of the New Testament, it was the studies of a number of German biblical scholars, uh, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, who was at Tübingen. Remember, we've mentioned Tübingen many a times. Uh, they set the tone. And then there was uh, Friedrich Schlemacher and Friedrich David Strauss. Um, Strauss's book is the one that really caused a stir. He wrote a book called The Life of Jesus Critically Examined. What made it controversial, and he's using these methods now, was his characterization of the miraculous elements in the Gospels as not fact, but as myth. Okay, remember, myth doesn't mean you throw it all out. It just means that the meaning is what is important, not the actual event. I think it's the three little pigs, right? We all believe that what, the, what that story has truth to it. Okay, but of course, at this time and place, that was a pretty radical thing to say. He took the Enlightenment view. It looked for logical, rational explanations for what was in the New Testament. In employing historical analysis, he explained the Gospels' presentation of Jesus. Now, this is what's important. As the product of the early church. The early church's use of Jewish ideas about what the Messiah would be like in order to express the conviction that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. So he's saying these texts came from the early church. Now we know the dates match up. We know that the Gospels didn't, weren't written at the time of Jesus' life. 30 years, 60 years, 100 years. Uh, so he was one of the first theologians to posit what we call a historical Jesus, whose divinity was denied, but that didn't mean his spiritual teachings were denied. What kind of reaction do you think this got? Well, from the Enlightenment scholars, yeah, okay, yeah. But there, uh, Carl August von Eschenmayer wrote a review in 1835, called it the Iscariotism of our days. Who was Judas Iscariot? And the Earl of Shaftesbury called the book the most pestilential book ever vomited out of the jaws of hell. Strauss responded by referring to the criticism as the offspring of the marriage between theological ignorance and religious intolerance. So <laughs> they're going at each other. Okay. Uh, and this, I've just given a brief uh, interpretation here of what was going on. But the development of higher biblical criticism could not be halted. And most leading seminaries today, both in Europe and the US, the tools of this tradition are still implemented and taught. I would imagine, to some degree, you received some of those tools. Yes, and, this, uh, and I appreciate uh, the bringing up how uh, the reaction to the uh, uh, higher criticism that the techniques that are used. Because even today, again, when you look at these wide spectrum of the different theological schools, mm -hmm. you have the mainline um, seminaries that teach political criticism as a way of investigating and, 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 uh, and studying uh, texts as well as um, uh, under, uh, looking at our faith. And then you have some of the other uh, more conservative seminaries that completely avoid it. Should I read that again? Pestilential book ever vomited out of the jaws of hell. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In any case, um, so but here's that here's it, and it 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 wasn't just in the seminaries. It sort of filtered down a bit into popular culture. Here's a good example. Do they do you remember these things? 
the, the Encyclopedia Britannica. How did it treat the story of Noah's Ark? It, we, it's interesting to trace. The first edition, 1771, the story of Noah and the Ark is treated as essentially factual. So if you got the edition of 1771, it said, this is what it said, Buteo and Kircher, I'm not sure who they are, have proved geometrically that taking the common cubit as a foot and a half, the ark was abundantly sufficient for all the animals supposed to be lodged in it. The number of species of animals will be found much less than is generally imagined, not amounting to over a hundred species of quadrupeds. That was in 1771. Okay. By the eighth edition, however, the encyclopedia says of the Noah story, the difficulties connected with the belief that all existent species of animals were provided for in the ark are obviated by adopting the suggestion that the deluge did not extend beyond the region of the earth then inhabited. So they now said, okay, well, how do we explain it now? Well, it only refers to this sphere. So that's, seven, that's 1875. 1960 edition, we find the following. Before the days of higher criticism and the rise of modern scientific views as to the origin of the species, there was much discussion among the learned and many ingenious and curious theories were advanced as to the number of animals on the ark. That's their entry for that year. So you see how Oh, if you just look at the encyclopedia, the things that they're reporting, you can see the change from literal to, well, there's some issues here. Okay. And, and issues with science. Okay. So that's higher biblical, uh, that's the historical critical method and a bit of higher biblical criticism. Uh, we've been talking about maybe going into this with greater depth sometime down the line because it, it, it's very important. So uh, as mentioned earlier in 1985, Croissant and Robert Funk founded the Jesus Seminar. Do you see the little hand, there's a little bead there, I'll explain that. This was under the auspices of what was known as the West Star Institute. It was a group of about, I think at the time, about 100 to 150 scholars. It's, it's grown and shrunk periodically. And layman, its mission was to decide from their collective view, let's say we're all here together, we're all scholars, we're all biblical scholars, to decide on the historicity of the deeds and sayings as found in the Gospels. Okay. What can we believe as historical fact as opposed to perhaps creative expression? So this is, this is what they set out to try and do, using the techniques, and I'll go through some of these in a little greater detail, uh, that I suggested under uh, the critical method. Um, so they wanted to know what was actually said and done as opposed to what might have actually been, what was reported as said and done. Yep. Uh, the seminar treats the Gospels thus as historical sources that contain some of Jesus' actual words and deeds, as well as elaborations of the early Christian community. You see the difference between the two? One, if we can agree that Jesus actually said this, and we'll, we'll use our tools, and if not, maybe this was something people later said he said. And not, because, not for evil reasons, but that's what happens over time. You tend to interpret things in terms of your own context. So that was the goal. Uh, so as part of it, the, this is the method they use. Members would vote on what they thought the authenticity of Jesus' saying and deeds by using colored beads. Red beads. So we're gonna, we read a passage, let's say, out of Luke. And everyone, what do we think about this? If you used a red bead, that indicated the voter believed Jesus did say the passage quoted, or something very, very close. Pink bead indicated the voter believed Jesus probably said the passage, but wasn't convinced 
Gray bead indicated the voter believed Jesus did not say the passage, but it actually contained his ideas. In other words, he didn't actually say it that way, but the idea was there. Black beads, the voter believed Jesus did not say the passage, and it came from a later tradition of the church. So that was what they were trying to do. And using this method, they produced a new translation of the New Testament, and it's sitting right over there. I brought it with me tonight. Uh, they are, and, and three other reports, the five gospel, the Acts of Jesus and the Gospel of Jesus. If anyone wants to take a look later, what they do, what that Bible does is it's color-coded. If you look at the passages, you'll find certain lines are in red, certain lines are in pink, certain lines are in gray, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the seminar's general reconstruction of the historical Jesus portrays him as an itinerant Jewish sage and faith healer who preached the gospel of liberation from injustice by using largely parables and aphorisms. He was a radical who broke with established Jewish theological dogma and social conventions, both in his teachings and his behaviors. He preached heaven's imperial rule, or what we call the kingdom of God, as already being present, but unseen. Kingdom of God wasn't something way out in the future. The kingdom of God is right here, right now, but you have to see it. This, now remember, this is their interpretation. He depicted God as a loving father, he fraternized with outsiders and often criticized insiders. He was a mortal man born of two human parents. He did not perform miracles or die as a substitute for sinners. He did not hold an uh, apocalyptic view that the world was coming to an end. That was later the early church. Rather, than instructing his disciples to prepare for the end of the world, the seminar fellows argued that the authentic words indicate he encouraged all of God's children to repair the world. And don't think, don't get ready for its end. Repair it. And I think I might have mentioned this earlier that you find this also in the Jewish Kabbalah tradition, the mystical tradition of the, the vases that shatter at creation. And man's role is to put them back together. Okay. So uh, it'd be well beyond the scope here to look at all the methods they use, but I want to go through five. And here they are. These are the criterion that they would base their decisions. The first is called the criterion of multiple attestation which is based on the position that the more independent witnesses that report an event are saying, the more authentic it is. Does that make sense? Okay. Notice it says independent. For example, five different sources reporting an event as opposed to one. If you just have one source reporting it, well, the authenticity is, but if you have five independent sources. Yep. For example, they use, if it's, in, if it's not only in the Gospels, but it's in Paul, it's in the historian Josephus, and it's in some of the other Gospels that may not have been brought into the canon. If you find something in all of these, it's probably authentic, as opposed to just finding it in one source. Uh, it, it has a kind of objectivity. I mean, we use this in courtrooms, don't we? <laughs> if you've got one witness that sees something, but if you've got five, so... So given the independence of the sources, it's harder to maintain that it was an invention of the later church. Second is called the criterion of originality. In conflicting reports, the earliest text is generally given greater weight. Especially when later stories elaborate. The fish always gets progressively bigger not smaller. 
So if you have a series of stories, it's most likely that the earliest story is more accurate. There's a tendency in human beings to elaborate on stories. You don't find them going the other way, usually. If you have someone who caught a fish, they don't come and say, well, it was actually smaller. And then the next day, well, no, it was even smaller than that. So, so this is uh, that. So an, an example, Mark's description, Mark is the first gospel, of the empty tomb which is not filled with elaborate resurrection descriptions is considered the most authentic. If we look, there's a whole, if you trace and look at the different uh, stories of the empty tomb, they become more elaborate. In fact, some of, the, some of the non-canonical gospels have some amazing things, like a cross coming out of the tomb with angel. I mean, so this is one, is it, it now the point here is this is a method you don't, it, and you don't even have to agree with it. But the, if you're trying to solve these problems, you've got to have some tools. The third is, this is an interesting one. It's called the criterion of dissimilarity, also known as the criterion of embarrassment. Put simply, this criterion states, trust the embarrassing material. If something is awkward, for an author to say, and he does it anyway, it's more likely to be true. The essence of the criterion of dissimilar is that the early church would hardly have gone out of its way to create historical material that embarrassed its author. Let me give you an example outside of it. If a wife wrote and admitted something about her husband that was both embarrassing to herself and not advantageous, it would probably be true even if the family later tried to do what? Cover it up. Okay. Thus, embarrassing material coming from or about Jesus would have been either suppressed or softened in later stages of the gospel tradition. And often we find this. Let me give you an example. The baptism of Jesus. The, in something called the Gospel of the Hebrews, which is a non-canonical gospel. It's mentioned in the works of the church fathers. Jesus is but a man submitting to another man, John, for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, who ba he baptizes, right? He submits to John. Mark's description, that's the first gospel, adds the Baptist statement to Jesus, I should be baptized by you. Doing what? Raising it up a bit. Gospel of Matthew attempts to explain this dynamic by omitting the words for the forgiveness of sin. And the Gospel of Luke only says that Jesus was baptized without explicitly asserting that John performed the baptism. And the Gospel of John, nothing. So this might show a progression where the evangelist attempting to explain away then suppress a story that would have been embarrassing to the early church. What would have been embarrassing about Jesus being baptized by John? He's the son of God. He doesn't need to be baptized by anyone. So this is, that's the method they would use. Okay. This is probably true. In any case, the fourth criterion holds that a saying or attributed to Jesus may be accepted as authentic if it coheres or fits with other sayings that have already been established. This is where things have to fit. If you find one saying in, in the Gospels that doesn't seem to fit with the overall pattern of other things that have been accepted, it probably is not authentic. For example, Luke 19, 11, 27 where Jesus calls upon his followers to slay those who do not believe in him. Does that fit other, con other passages? So that would probably be eliminated. This was probably added for some other reason. Fifth, there's the criterion of historical applicability. Sayings and actions of the historical Jesus must reflect the concrete historical, social, political, economic conditions of time and place. I, I mentioned that under the higher criticism. 
in which he lived, namely first century Palestine. So if there's something said that doesn't fit into that context, you're going to be suspicious of it. You're going to be suspicious of it. And like I said, a more recent example would be uh, if I told you FDR flew a 747 to Yalta. Okay. We, you know, that doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. The sayings and actions of Jesus that reflect other conditions that were outside of Palestine or only after his death have to be questioned. Classic example. Jesus' reference in the Gospels to the destruction of the temple, which didn't take place until 35 years after his death. Such situations are referred to as retrospective prophecy. Do you see how that would work? I'm writing the text at a time I know the temple has been destroyed. I then take that information and put it into Jesus' mouth. So if you have a statement that comes from a different time, you've got to question that. At least that's what, what this says. Now, the point of all this isn't to undermine the central message of Jesus. That wasn't their goal. Their goal was to actually, I think, allow thinking people to believe in the Christian religion without having to buy all the paraphernalia that often conservative Christianity offers with it. That was their approach. I mean, Croissant, if you just look at his life, I mean, he's a Christian Christian. <laughs> he wasn't trying to get rid of Christianity. He's just trying to elaborate and show that the essence of Christianity is the way, not all the details uh, of the Gospels, because some of them are, are, are pretty hard to buy. I think it's important to understand that this was a approach. Yeah, it's only one. Not the approach, but a approach. Yeah. You, in fact, political criticism, um, uh, there are some factors here, that, again, as uh, Dr. Bill said. It's a big tent. <laughs> uh, the big tent and Oh, yeah. within the uh, uh, scholastic world too, yep. uh, because uh, there's some criteria there that uh, uh, are also challenged by other scholars. Mm -hmm. For example, some, sometimes the reading that is most um, uh, weighted heavier is not necessarily, there's a question of earlier text is also challenged with understanding the manuscripts. Yep. But one of the um, uh, things that I remember learning when I was in biblical class was the harder reading is one that you would weigh heavier because mm -hmm. the tendency for, for um, uh, subsequent manuscripts is to soften it, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. To make it easier to read. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so there's many uh, biblical or techniques mm -hmm. that, are, uh, that um, exist. The Jesus Seminar um, had to create a, a guideline and mm -hmm. these these are the guidelines that he decided to follow. Yep. Um, one of the, the uh, assumptions is, again, looking at the historical Jesus, they, they intentionally wanted to uh, avoid the, the, the assumption of the, the uh, again, the miracles, yep. the, the, de the, the deity factor. Mm -hmm. So try to look at it from a straightforward, okay, from a very logical, naturalistic way of looking at Jesus, these were the criteria that they approached. Yeah. And I, I, I should probably say that they don't all, they don't all agree. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah. The, what they tended to do, like in any, when you, if you're voting, you take, okay, we had 20 red beads and five, but that was the weight. But not everyone in the seminar agrees. I've been to these, and there's some pretty good arguments, but they're civil. <laughs> they're, they're civil theological arguments. Uh, I went to, to one up in Ojai with uh, uh, John Zimmer. It happened to be on Paul. And it was, it was really good. I mean, there were different approaches, different, but everyone respected each other. They don't have to agree to, re to give respect. I think that's the idea. Uh, okay. Um, 
So, uh, where were we? Okay. Um, anyway, okay, so those, that's the Jesus Seminar. So, and all of this was meant to exemplify some of the methodologies Croissant employs in his approach to who Jesus was and what he claimed. And he wrote a number of books. Perhaps the most well-known is The Historical Jesus, Life of a Mediterranean Jewish Peasant, where he portrays Jesus as a intelligent, courageous Jewish peasant, a radical, social, nonviolent revolutionary, with a vision of economic, political, and religious egalitarianism. He's a healer. He's a wise man who taught a message of inclusiveness, tolerance, and spiritual liberation. In so doing, he used a strategy that was a combination of free healing and communal eating. Croissant makes that a very important, the people who eat together. When you eat together with someone, it, it, there's, a, there's a different connection there. And he negated the hierarchical normacies of both the Jewish religion and Roman power. Jews would not eat with Gentiles. Yep. That becomes an issue. Yep. Jesus says, you eat with your brothers and sisters. And who are your brothers and sisters? Even the Samaritan. Uh, so he's also a healer. He was a proclaimer that such hierarchies should not exist and that the worldly power did not equate to divine power. What was the worldly power at the time? Rome. Yeah. And he spends much of his time, interesting, describing the socioeconomic conditions of rural Palestine and the characteristics of the people to whom Jesus was probably speaking. When we think of Jesus, who do we think of him speaking to? Poor. What? Poor the yeah, generally the poor and the and every once in a while there's a Pharisee thrown in there to to sort of you, <laughs> as a as a straw man. But yeah, and this is what this is what Croissant says. He comes as yet unknown. He's talking about Jesus into a hamlet of Lower Galilee. He is watched by the cold, hard eyes of peasants living long enough at a subsistence level to know exactly where the line is drawn between poverty and destitution. He speaks about the rule of God, and they listen as much from curiosity as anything else. They know all about rule and power, about kingdom and empire, but they know it in terms of tax and debt, malnutrition, sickness, agrarian oppression. What they really want to know, can this kingdom of God do anything for the lame child, the blind parent, the demented soul screaming its isolation? I, 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 to me, that's the, he's talking to people who are really, and if you know anything about, the, and there have been studies done of the, of the peasantry at this time, it was a pretty rough existence, to say the least. Heavily taxed, often on the verge of starvation, illness, and Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom of God to them. So what's their approach going to be? If someone, if you're, if you're really down and out and someone comes, pre, are you going to just, oh yes, they're going to be what? Skeptical at first. They have to be won over somehow. And from what we understand, many of them were. They were won over by his person, his message, his compassion, his understanding of their condition. That's how I read it. Okay. He was thus a man, and this is for Kassan, who could speak to those people and their needs. But when he did that, too often, he ran into trouble with the power structure. Okay. And as a result, he was arrested and crucified. One of his, Croissant's 
best known books is The Power of Parable. How fiction by Jesus became fiction about Jesus. And it, as you can imagine, it was very controversial. So it begins with his understanding of Jesus' most distinctive teaching vehicle, the parable, which he defines as a metaphorical story. He then turns to explain that the gospel authors did something very similar to what Jesus did. Jesus made up stories about ordinary people and situations to convey his countercultural vision. Okay, he made these up as teaching tools. In turn, according to Croissant, the gospel authors made up stories about Jesus to convey their compelling visions of who Jesus was and why he was significant. They used the same method he did. That was Croissant's claim. He also argues that Mark and Luke misrepresent the nature of Jesus' parables. And I believe uh, Reverend Elbert spoke about this at one time. Croissant claims that Jesus used challenge parables. What is a challenge parable? It's a ch parable that challenges the, healer, the, the hearers to step back and reflect on the world and on God in counterintuitive ways. Classic example, the Good Samaritan, which is long provided Croissant's classic example. We all know the story, right? A man, presumably Jewish, lies half dead at the roadside. And when two respectable Jews come by, they avoid the victim and leave him to his fate. But nearly all of Jesus' parables come with a hook or a surprise. The parable's hook resides not in the fact that a third party passerby stops and helps. What's the hook? Who the man is. He's not a Jew. He's a Samaritan. And you have to understand the relationship between Jews and Samaritans at that time. It was not a good one to say the least. So it's not surprising, Croissant argues, that the man stops. What is shocking is the kind of man who stops. And that's the essence of a challenge parable. It takes ordinary expectations and turns them upside down. You would expect eventually someone would help the guy. Yeah, it might not have been the lawyer, it might not have been the priest, but he wouldn't have found anything unusual if someone stopped. What people of the time would have found unusual is that a Samaritan stopped. And what's the message that Jesus is saying? How many Jews would stop for a Samaritan? That's the other side of that hook. A Samaritan stopped to help a Jew. Would a Jew stop to help a Samaritan? So it says, what kind of world do we inhabit when good Jews fail to show compassion, but wicked Samaritans offer mercy? That's the switch. OK, two other uh, works that were significant, uh, Who Killed Jesus and God and Empire. In Who Killed Jesus, published in 1995, Croissant draws together a wide range of sources to demonstrate that the Jews not only did not crucify Jesus, the Romans did, but they were not even consulted by Pontius Pilate. They claim that was a later fabrication. Why? We know a lot about Pontius Pilate. He was not, you know, what's the image sometimes you get of Pontius Pilate? I can't make the decision. Well, wash my hands, okay? That wasn't Pontius Pilate. He was withdrawn later for his overt cruelty, taken back to Rome. So that's not an image of Pontius Pilate. He uses that. Further, Jewish leadership did not have a meeting on the eve of Passover, as meetings were and are still forbidden on that day. He then discusses why later tales appear in the Gospels. 
Namely, it was an early Christian myth directed against rival Jewish groups in the Roman Empire. Again, you don't have to believe this. This is just an argument that he's offering. This was written, I believe, not long after the movie that came out by Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson. Yeah. Which made it look like the, Jew, I mean, the Jewish leadership was really involved in this. In, the, in any case, uh, this book was just, no, was the Romans. Some of the Jewish leadership may have gone along with it, and the reason they would have gone along with it was because if they didn't, what would have been the consequences? Jesus was not the only person ever crucified in, in, in Judea. There was an earlier revolt where a hundred were crucified. And there were later revolts. Crucifixion was the worst possible because it said you are the lowest of the low. You are a criminal. You are for treason against the Roman Empire. Okay, that was who, who killed Jesus. In God and Empire, Jesus against Rome. Notice the then, whoops. And the, the subtitle is Then and Now. I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, in this work, uh, he assumes the reader is familiar with key points of his earlier work. Jesus was a nonviolent revolutionary who had the kingdom movement. Kingdom of God is here. Which contrasted to the surrounding matrix of the Roman imperial theological system. That system had an equation. You want peace? It goes this way. Religion, war, victory, peace. That's how the Romans operated. Now they were referring to their religion. So when there, if there's a problem, their gods support it. They go to war. You got to win. Then you'll have peace. And that's why it was called the Pax Romana. That's what Augustus did. He, got, he won. He won these. Now, what Croissant is, is then comparing Jesus' kingdom with that. Okay. Notice there's no word of justice in the Roman formula. It's war and victory. That's what will bring about peace. You don't talk about, no more about justice. If you have an opponent, you beat him. You beat him, and how do you beat him? You beat him badly. Romans didn't have this, what does people say? Bleeding heart liberal. <laughs> now, they got rid of people. If they didn't like something, they went. What did they do to Carthage? They burned it to the ground and put salt in the fields. That's how the Romans got peace. And Croissant is comparing that to the way of Jesus and his kingdom. He also introduces an interesting historical fact. Oh, we got a little time. Which many readers may at first think obvious. Namely, there was a human being in the first century who was called divine, son of God, God from God, whose titles were Lord, Redeemer, Liberator, and Savior of the world. Who was it? Emperor Augustus. Those were all titles of the Roman emperor. Croissant cites their adoption and application by the early Christians to Jesus as denying them to Caesar. As he writes, they were taking the identity of the Roman emperor and giving it to a Jewish peasant. It was what the Romans called high treason. But this is what the, the comparison. Who's the real son of God? The Roman emperor with his formula? That's the way of the world. That's not Jesus' vision of the kingdom of God. There has to be justice for there to be peace. Okay, most re more recently he's teamed up, or I should say did team up because Marcus Borg is now dead. Marcus Borg, the Protestant uh, theologian, thinker, 
they, they co-authored a number of three very interesting books. The First Christmas, The Last Week, and The First Paul. The First Christmas, in this they point out only two of the Gospels contain the Nativity. Which are the two Gospels that have the story of the birth? Matthew and Luke. Mark doesn't have it. John doesn't have it. That, you might, that might be just an interesting question. Why doesn't Mark have it? Why doesn't John have it? Maybe they didn't think it was important. If they thought it was important, wouldn't it be there? What was, what was more important? Easter. Resurrection. In any case, um, they point out, but they also point out that even Luke and Matthew have very divergent stories. In Matthew, Jesus is born in a house. In Luke, he's born in a stable. In Luke, you get shepherds and angels. You don't get wise men or wise people, I guess we call it. <laughs> Although I've heard that, that argued too, that in that era, people had they had their animals in the house. Yeah, of course, of course, you can, yeah, you can always, and I don't mean this negatively, but you can always spin anything, right? I mean, you can always take it and sort of, well, but, but, it, but, 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 and they're pointing this out, not, they say when you go to a pageant, you're going to see a conflation. When you see the Christmas pageant, you see the two stories brought together. But that's okay, because what's important is the meaning, not the details. It's the meaning of the Christmas story that's important. If you get hung up on the details, you'll start fighting with each other. And, and you're a heretic because you don't believe in this or that. It's the meaning. It's the meaning. That's why they wrote that book. Um, in the last week, and uh, Reverend Elbert did a class sort of based on this, uh, which deals with um, uh, the day-by-day -day account of Jesus' final week. Remember, I think, yeah, did you do that here? I believe so, yeah. Uh, and they begin their story in Palm Sunday, and this is the, the great imagery, two entries into Jerusalem. One, Jesus on a donkey, the other, Pilate and his troops coming in at different gates. What a wonderful contrast. These are the two uh, value systems that are, that are at war with one, one another. Um, uh, the Jesus introduced by Borg and Croissant is more socially dangerous than sometimes the one that is found in the church traditional teachings. The last week depicts Jesus giving up his life to protest power without justice and to condemn those who don't take care of the needy and those who are need. The last one, the first Paul, this is the one that uh, John and I uh, went to the J Jesus seminar when they were talking about this. Uh, I'm going to run through this quickly. It's probably a class we could do on Paul, but uh, what this book tries to show is that there's three different Pauls, depending on which books, which letters you read of his. Uh, his there are 13 letters, okay, 13 epistles. But it's apparent from analysis that some of those were probably not his. They were written in his name. Now, we've got to understand this. This wasn't necessarily plagiarism. This was a common, this was kind of a common practice at the time. If you had a great dis guru that you would write some, you would give it, that's, that's what you would do. This is, it was your view, but you weren't going to take the credit because he's higher than you. So that's probably part of what happened. Um, but it's usually broken down into the seven authentic letters, which they say are the radical Paul. The radical Paul. And then there are the next three letters, which are disputed. Maybe, maybe not. They're called the conservative Paul. And then the final three letters that are not his at all, in that they were the creation of the later church. They call this the reactionary Paul. So it's interesting. To which it's not three persons, it's three categories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not three persons. Three, <laughs> three, three, vision, three versions of Paul. Yeah, there was only one Paul, I think but the versions that came across. Okay, I'm gonna 
if I had to sum up Croissan in a couple of phrases, it would be this. Could someone read that for me? Can you read it? In the Hebrew Bible, God says, yeah. I reject your worship because of your lack of justice. God never says, I reject your justice because of your lack of worship. Yeah. So what does that mean? If you're just hung up on the proper worship and there's no justice, no. But if you're just, even if you don't worship properly, that's more important. It's the way. Justice. And that's what Croissant's life, I think, essentially is about, attempt to find justice. He, uh, he was a, he's, he is of that Catholic tradition that sort of follows St. Francis in many ways. That the role of a good Catholic is not just to worship, but to seek justice. So as a result, he supported liberation theology in South America. He's, he's on the left, let's face it. Okay. But he, he, he claims that he gets his left leaning from Jesus and his studies. Okay, that sort of brings us to the end of these, these three. Um, good. Okay, we've kept you much longer than you probably anticipated. But <laughs> thanks again for coming, and uh, have, a, have a good Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you.